number six. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jad Corey. I'm from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Um, I just want to thank you for sharing your wisdom. And my question is, um, what criteria do you use to sell stock? I kind of understand how you buy it, but I'm not sure how you sell. Yeah. Well, the best thing to do is buy a stock that you don't ever want to sell. I mean, that, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and that's true when we buy an entire business. I mean, we've bought all of Geico, or we've bought all of C's Candy or the Buffalo News. We're not buying those to resell. I mean, what we're trying to do is buy a business that we will be happy with if we own it the rest of our lives, and we expect to with those. It's the same principle applies to marketable securities. You get extra options with marketable securities. You can you you can add to holdings. Obviously, easier. We can never own more than 100% of a business, but if we own 2% of a business and we like it at a given price, we can add and have four or five percent. So that's that's a, that's an advantage. Sometimes, if we if we need money to move to another sector, like we did last year, we will trim from some holdings. But that doesn't mean we're negative on those businesses at all. I mean, we think they're wonderful businesses, or we wouldn't own them. And we would sell. Uh, a, if we needed money for other things. The Geico stock that I bought in 1951, I sold uh, in 1952. It was, you know, went on to be worth 100 or more times before the 1976 problems, 100 or more times what I paid. But I didn't have the money to do something else. So you sell if you need money for something else. You may sell if you believe that valuations between different kinds of markets are, are somewhat out of whack. And... Uh, you know, we, we have done a little trimming last year uh, uh, in that matter. But that, that, could, that could well be a mistake. I mean, the, the real thing to do with a great business is just hang on for dear life. Uh, Charlie? Yes, but this, the sales that do happen, the ideal way is when you found something you like immensely better. Isn't that obvious? That's the, that's the ideal way to sell. And incidentally, the ideal purchase is to find, is, is to have something that you already like be selling at a price where you feel like oh, buying more of it. I mean, it, uh, we probably should have done more of that in the past in, in, in some situations. But that's the beauty of, of marketable securities. You really do, if you're in a wonderful business, you do get a chance periodically maybe to double up in it or something of the sort. Uh, if, if the market, if the stock market were to sell a lot cheaper than it is now, we would probably be buy, buying more of the businesses uh, that we're all, we, that we already own. They would certainly be the first ones that we would think about. They're the, they're the businesses we like the best. Charlie? Right. No, nothing more. Okay, zone seven. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. My name is Ron Wright from Iowa City, Iowa. Uh, new companies have always been an interest to me. Is it reasonable to assume an uh, Omaha-based company uh, with only $5 billion in the bank, might succeed in telecommunications? Well, I, I think, I think uh, that a new company with $5 billion in the bank is probably better off than most new companies, but <laughs> <laughs> be like Jennifer Gates uh, as a new, newborn. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, I, I think you're probably referring to a company that was uh, that was created out of uh, one of our local operations that's run by Walter Scott, one of our directors uh, from the Keywood Company, Level 3. Uh, I can tell you it's got very able management, and, I, and I'll take your word for it that it's also got five, but uh, you'll have to make your own judgment on the stock. I know Charlie won't comment on that one. <laughs> Well, I live in the wonderful tropical island of Omaha. <laughs> That's right up there with Exarban. That's Nebraska spelled yeah. backwards. <laughs> Everybody in this room's got to be wondering the same question. Who, in your opinion, both of you, is the next Warren Buffett? Mm -hmm. Charlie? Who's the next Charlie Munger? Well, let's try that first. That's, that's a more difficult question. <laughs> There's not much demand. <laughs> I don't think there's only one way to succeed in life, and, and 
and our successors in due kind of time may be different in, in many ways, and they may do better. Incidentally, we have a number of people in the company, some of whom are in this room today, and the ones you saw on that screen, who are leagues ahead of, of Charlie and me in, in, in various kinds of abilities. I mean, there's a lot of different talents. We've got a fellow in this room tonight, today who's the best bridge player probably in the world, and Charlie and I could work night and day, and if he spent 10 minutes a week working on it, he'd play better bridge than we would. And, and uh, all kinds of intellectual endeavors that for some reason or another, one person's a little bit better wired for than, than someone else. And uh, we have people running our businesses that if Charlie and I were put in charge of those businesses, we, we couldn't do remotely as, as, as well as they do. So there's, there's a lot of different talents. They, they, the two that we're responsible for is keep able people who are already rich uh, motivated to keep uh, keep working at things where they don't need to do it for financial don't need to do it for financial reasons I mean it's it's that simple and 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 that's 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 a problem any of you could think about uh, and and you'd, you'd probably be quite good at it if you, if you gave it a little thought because you'd figure out what would cause you to work if you were already rich and uh, didn't need the job, why would you jump out of bed and be excited about going to work that day? And then we try to apply that to the people who work with us. Secondly, we have to allocate capital. And these days we have to allocate a lot more capital than we had to allocate uh, a decade ago. That job is very tough at present. Sometimes it's very easy. And it will be easy at times in the future and it'll be difficult at times in the future. But there are other people that can allocate capital and, and uh, we, have, we, have them, we have them in the company. Charlie, I mean, no, okay. Zone three. Jane Bell, Des Moines. Since I became a Berkshire Hathaway shareholder, I've been coming to these meetings. This is my second. <laughs> I've been coming to these meetings ever since I've been a shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Buffett, I'm a partner and owner in a consulting business, and we tell our clients and potential clients that we design solutions for what keeps them awake at night. Mr. Buffett, from your perspective as an investor, what keeps you awake at night? Yeah. Well, that's a good question, and I, that's one I always ask the managements of our subsidiaries as well as uh, any, any new investment. I want to know what their nightmare is. Uh, Andy Grove in his book, uh, Only the Paranoid Survive, talks about the silver bullet for a competitor. So in terms of a, if you only had one silver bullet, which competitor would you fire it at? And it's not a bad question. And uh, your question's a little broader. If you only had one worry that you could get rid of, what would it be? I would say that, I, Char, I, I'm, and I think I speak for Charlie, I'll let him do it, but we really don't worry. Uh, you know, we, we will do the best we can and when we have capital allocated, sometimes it's very easy to do. Sometimes it's it's almost impossible to do. But we're not going to worry about it because it you know it, it the world changes. And uh, uh, if we had something we were worried about in the business, we would correct it. We're we're we're, we're, we're I'm not worried about anything. I'm not really worried about about uh, you know we can lose a billion dollars on a California earthquake. Uh, uh, but I'm not worried about it. Although I have a sister is in the audience that lives in California. I've, I've told her to call me quickly if the dogs start running in circles or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's, you know, if you're worried about something, thing to do is, is, is get it corrected and get back to sleep. Uh, and, and I can't think of anything I'm worried about at Berkshire. That doesn't mean that I have, I have any good ideas as to what we uh, should be doing with a lot of, a whole lot of money that we have around. But, you know, I can't do anything about that except keep looking for things that I might understand and, and do something with the money. And if, if they aren't there, they aren't there. And we'll, we'll see what happens tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. Charlie, what are you worried about? Well, in the 30 some years I've been watching you, I would say what it takes to make you not sleep at night is an illness in the family. <laughs> Short of that, uh, Warren likes the game. I like the game. And even in the periods that look tough to other people, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> In fact, it probably is the most... <laughs>
It, it's sort of, it is the most, I mean, we, we define tough times differently than other people would, but, but our idea of tough times is like now, and our idea of, uh, we don't feel it's tough times when the market's going down a lot or anything of the sort. So we, we are having a good time uh, then. I mean, it, uh, we don't want to sound like undertakers during a plague or anything, but, uh, uh, but it, it, there's really, uh, you know, it makes no difference to us whether, whether our, some the price of Berkshire is going up or down. We're trying to figure out ways to make the, the the company worth more money years down the road. And if we figure that out, the stock will take care of itself. So, and usually when the stock is going down, uh, it means other things are going down, and that it, it's it's a better chance for us to deploy capital, and that's our business. So, we you will not see us worrying. And maybe we should. You know what may worry? <laughs> no, uh, zone four. My name is Peel Yoon from LA, California. Mr. Warren Buffett, Mr. Twitter, I'm one of the per persons who highly admire you both. I have, I have two questions. Question one, your view on world financial business environment in the next decade. Question two, U.S. position for economic competition in the next decade. Thank you. Well, you, you've asked two big questions, but, but you're going to get very small answers, I'm afraid. I, and that's no disrespect, but we, we, we just, we don't have that. We, we, we don't think about those things very much. We, we, just, we just are looking for decent businesses. And, and incidentally, our views in the past wouldn't have been any good on those subjects and we try to we try to think about two things we try to think about things that are important and things that are knowable now there are things that are important that are not knowable in our view those two questions that you raised fall on that there are things that are knowable but not important we don't want to clutter our minds up with those so we're we say what is important and what is knowable and what among the things that fall within those two categories can we translate into some kind of an action that is, is useful for Berkshire. And, and we really, there are all kinds of important subjects that Charlie and I, we don't know anything about. And, and therefore we don't think about them. So we have our view about what the world will look like over the next 10 years in, in business or competitive situations. We're just no good. We, we do think we know something about what Coca-Cola is gonna look like in 10 years or what Gillette's gonna look like in 10 years or what Disney's gonna look like in 10 years or what some of our operating subsidiaries are gonna look like in 10 years. We care a lot about that. We think a lot about that. We want to be right about that. If we're right about that. The other things get to be, uh, you know, they're they're, they're just they're, they're they're less important. And and if we started focusing on those, we would miss a lot of big things. I've, I've used this example before, but Coca-Cola went public, and I think it was 1919. And the first year, one share cost forty dollars. The first year it went down a little over 50%. At the end of the year, it was down to $19. There were some problems with bottler contracts, there was problems with sugar, various kinds of problems. If you'd had perfect foresight, you would have seen the world's greatest depression staring you in the face when, when the social order even got questioned. You would have seen World War II, you would have seen atomic bombs and, and, and hydrogen bombs. You would have seen all kinds of things. And you could always find a reason to postpone uh, why you should buy that share of Coca-Cola. But the important thing wasn't to see that. The important thing was to see that they were going to be selling a billion eight-ounce servings of, of beverages a day in, uh, this year, or some large number. And that the person who could make people happy a, a billion times a day around the globe ought to make a few bucks off doing it. And so that $40, which went down to $19, I think with dividends reinvested, has to be well over $5 million now. And if you develop the view on these other subjects that in any way forestalled you acting on this more important, specific, narrow view about the future of the company, uh, you would have missed, you'd have missed a great ride. So that's, that's the kind of thing we focus on. Charlie? Yeah, we're not predicting the currents that will come, just how some things will swim in the currents, whatever they are. 